Thank you for clicking this video. I wanted to do a video presentation day on this paper right here, The Implied Order Book by Squeeze Metrics, published in July of 2020. I'm Daniel, uh, aka Trader McStockster on the socials, and I'm a futures trader. Um, I'm from the South. I have an accent. Welcome to the channel. So I use Gamma a lot for my trading. And um, I, I felt it was important to just go back and discuss this paper that, that kind of brought me so many ideas and really, the, frankly, that other services use seems to be based off this. Um, this paper, you know, helps to, to judge market volatility, um, market liquidity, and even, even market sentiment. And so if you're anything like me, the first time you read it, you know, I got lost somewhere in the middle and, and especially towards the end. And so... When I, was, uh, when I was in grad school, we had these classes called journal clubs where we would meet every week and discuss a paper and present it like this and go through it line by line and just really dig into it. And that, that really helped, you know, understand the paper and the maybe hopefully what the author meant for us to get, you know, when, the, when they wrote it. And so problem there is I don't have a class of people to ask questions and poke holes in it and I'm just talking to a camera so that's where you guys got to leave me some comments and then I'll reply back in the next video or something so so that's what this video is it's, it's a presentation of this research paper not necessarily like a bullet point list on gamma because um, you could kind of find that you know at other places on YouTube and so um, to truly appreciate this paper by the way I actually felt it was pretty uh, important at least in my opinion to go back and study their first paper called Gamma Exposure in 2017. And so I'm going to go over that one too um, briefly just to kind of set up the implied order book paper. And so, and by the way, on th this paper, y'all, I mean, there's only two figures. So there's a lot of words. So y'all just have to bear with me. And I know some of the slides are going to be like, that is too many words. I can't handle it next. But uh, I'll try and I'll try and get through that pretty quick. So um, and, and then one last thing that this video is my interpretation of how I read these papers. And so I hope I get it right. I mean, I'm, but I may say something wrong. Just let me know. I'll try and reply to it, but I'm going to do my best not to. Um, and I thought about later, you know, I could make a video on how I actually use gamma in the markets and some of those tools I mentioned, but, but for today, we're just going to present these papers. And so for that, I made a little PowerPoint. So we're going to switch over uh, to that. So first, starting with the Gamma Exposure paper. All right. And so topics I want to go through today are we're going to look at the OG GEX paper, talk about Gamma Exposure, in this paper, mostly in a sense of a volatility measurement. And so they talk about delta hedging. They talk, And then they have four assumptions that are pretty important to understanding uh, this paper. And then we'll go over the limitations. Then we'll get into the implied order book. Um, which is really more about liquidity. And so the first one's about volatility. And the second one's about liquidity, which is about volatility, but they, they really they really doubt it in there on the, on the second paper. So additions in this paper, they talk about Vanna, Charm. They go over dynamic hedging again, um, implied volatility as a measurement of liquidity. And then they're going to talk about conditional liquidity or, and you know how it moves when price moves and how to create an implied order book uh, for that and then i'm going to talk a little bit about how market crashes happen so getting into the first paper um so here we go so the first thing they do is they kind of low-key bash the vix it, or at least that's my interpretation or, or they don't really bash the vix they sort of bash practitioners for overusing vix and they're, they're basically like the way i read it is like they're almost it's like they're almost blown away that we use VIX so much, and it's based off two numbers. And so I put the exact quote in here because I liked it. And so historically, here's what they say. Historically, the published research on the effect of equity options on underlying prices has been limited to theorizing about the effects of option introduction and expiration. Meanwhile, and this is the sentence I underlined, practitioners refer almost exclusively to the volatility and variance figures implied by the quotes of only a small strip of strike prices interpolated across two near-term contracts. And so then they get into that the VIX is, is actually more correlated to the, the last month, which would be realized volatility, 
although it's kind of supposed to be used to predict the future month's volatility. And so they found it was 0 0.85 and 0 0.75 um, respectively. And so then that brings us to our first figure here, using it kind of as a volatility metric. And so they basically the GEX is more granular. So right here we have two figures and these are the VIX versus SPX returns and the GEX versus SPX returns. And so the X axis on both of these is one day percent returns for the SPX and the Y axis is the VIX on the left chart and then the GEX on the right chart. So they, they took basically the bottom half of VIX spot closes and split them into quartiles. And then they took the top half of GEX values because um, basically the low VIX or a high GEX is what predicts low volatility. And so basically all we're really supposed to, to glean from these figures here is that the VIX ones, the whole bottom half, is that they're not that different. So 0.51%, 0.66% um, between the, the two lowest quartiles. Meanwhile, the VIX, uh, the GEX over here, 0.55%, 0.85%. So they're more different. So when you look at these, you see kind of the blue is close to green. So that shows kind of a similar variance on the VIX there. And then over here on the, the GEX, you know, the blue is a little bit wider and the, the green one, um, the highest one is more taller and more narrow. And so it just has a better granular view uh, of variance in the GEX, the VIX, excuse me. So to quote, we believe that there are, that the greater granularity of the GEX distribution suggests that there is some element of market volatility that is simply not able to be captured by the VIX model or indeed any other variance metric based on quoted option prices. Rather than prices, GEX concerns itself with the quantity and the characteristics of all existing option contracts at all strikes and at all expirations and the market participants who trade them. So we've got that. Um, next thing we're going to get into is this idea of dynamic he hedging uh, for the first time. So, hedging deltas. So, in order to limit the risk, a market maker or a dealer must limit his exposure to deltas. And so we're going to go through an example. So, if a retail trader buys a 20 delta put from a dealer, trader buys, dealer sells, then the dealer, so at that point, now the dealer is exposed. So they don't really want exposure. So to limit their exposure, um, then now they must sell 20 shares of the underlying to remain risk neutral. So the hedge result there is that they're short selling. If the price drops further, a 20 delta put becomes a 50 delta, then now the dealer must sell an additional 30 shares. So the hedge result there is that they short 30 more shares. Thus, the market maker is essentially committed to buying and selling a predictable amount of stock. So, that's the basis, the ground layer, if you will. And so to come up with all this, they had to kind of overcome a couple of things. So they, they put in these four assumptions for, for the data that they get out of this paper. So it's a lot, it's a lot of words, but basically all options that you buy or sell are facilitated by Delta hedgers or market makers. Um, and they say basically that traders or investors sell calls or buy puts. That's predominantly all we're doing here when we take this data. So when you sell a call, the dealer is buying that call from you. And when you buy that put for put protection, then they're selling it to you. And then the last thing is that they're going to hedge as price moves and they're going to do it precisely. And they, they figure that they use some kind of hedging bands just to balance the twin challenges of the hedging costs with the Delta risks. So a real quick gamma refresher, um, you know, Y'all know this, but delta is the change in option price per one point move in the underlying. And then gamma is the change in the option delta per one point move in the underlying. So if a gamma of a single 50 delta call option is 10, we can assume that dealer will rehedge that option to either 40 or 60 deltas in the event of a one point move. So in either case, the, the dealer there, they're going to need to trade 10 shares, buy 10 or short 10. And then we come up to the the part I, I use, and really most people are using this part right here, which is the GEX computations. How do we get this? So for call options here, top bullet point, the GEX of all call options at one particular strike is gamma times open interest times 100. 
And then for the put options, it's going to be gamma times open interest times 100 times negative 1 or times negative 100. And so, and then to make the GEX of the whole index, uh, it's just the summation of every strike price at every, in every available contract. So the market in, impact of GEX with these computations, that means a positive GEX figure implies that the option dealers will hedge their positions in a fashion that stifles volatility. So they will buy into lows and sell into highs. So as price drops, they buy and it sort of pushes it back up a little bit. And as price rises, they sell, buy into lows, sell into highs. So this movement right here, when it's positive GEX, is sort of the opposite of price direction. Price goes down, they buy, and that kind of slows the drop. If it goes up, they sell, and that kind of slows the rise. That's positive GEX. Now, a negative GEX implies the opposite, which magnifies market volatility. So they're going to sell into lows and then buy into highs. So this movement is in the same direction as price movement. So as price goes down, they sell, sending it down further. And then as price goes up, they buy, sending price up higher. Then they're going to quantify that, and they make this scatter plot right here. So on the y-axis here, what we have is the one-day close-to-close return of the S&P 500. And then on the x-axis, we have the gamma exposure in dollars. And so as you can see here, on the right side of zero, the positive is a much tighter much tighter range of dots here. And then on the left side there, much, much more spread out. So I just put a little box around it. The green is your positive GEX, and the red is your negative GEX. So that, that's pretty much it. That's the point of this paper, that when they add it all up, using those assumptions, that mostly we sell calls, so that means they buy them, and mostly that we buy puts, which means they sell them, add all that up, and you get this data right here, and you find that when you add it up, negative GEX has this much more volatile kind of action, and the positive is the opposite, tight range. So here are their sources um, for that paper, and then... Before I got move on to the implied order book, just a couple of limitations there, which is a little discussion moment here, is that the obvious limitation of this paper is that tr traders and investors, we don't only sell calls and buy puts so for starts. And then secondly, how about multi-leg contracts, uh, you know, with spreads or, or four or five leg contracts or whatever. So that, that would be, those assumptions also kind of imply Apply that it's a one single directional option and that's not really that's not really reality okay so moving on to the implied order book the implied order book measuring S&P 500 liquidity with SPX options so they start nice and simple I like how they start this paper out the stock market is a ledger of who is willing to buy or sell stock and at what price this ledger is called the limit order book and you've probably seen this here Here's your order book, your basic order book. The price would be right here in between the, the red and green. Here you have your best offer or the ask, and here you have your best bid. And these are just people's limit orders sitting there waiting on price to move into it to transact. Second slide, options have a nonlinear payoff. And so here on the left here, we have a payoff of a long put option. And you can see as it gets more negative, the Oh yeah, this y-axis here is a profit loss chart. This is profit and loss, profit in the green, losses in the red, and on the x-axis here, the underlying price of this put option. So as price drops, the profit goes up. As price rises, you have a minimal loss here of 25, so that's that would be the premium you paid for that put. So that's the nonlinear impact of an option. And so, but for our purposes, we're more interested in how that payoff is synthesized. Oh, by the way, I just threw in one quick slide of how that option looks the day you buy it. This is the actual curve, and you can see it's very nonlinear. This purple line here is like the day you buy the option, what the profit loss chart looks like. And the, the straight edge ones that we typically see, like that last side, are the day at expiration. So here we go. The impact of an at-the-money put option. So on the left side here, we have... If a trader shorts a put, what happens to the order book? So the, the actions in the colored text here are going to be like from the trader's perspective, and the order book down here is from the dealer's perspective. So when you short an at-the-money put option, they're going to install buy limits below price and sell limits above price. Now here, when you short a put, sorry, when you buy a put, 
they're going to have buy stops and sell stops um, above and below price. And so the this is delta hedging, and in this case, this would be a, a 50 delta put. And the, the distribution here, that's why it's pretty nice and even. And so let's say on the left here, if they must buy 50 deltas as price drops and delta goes up to 70, then they got to buy 20 more deltas. And, and yeah, on the right here, they, they got to short the stock on the way down using market orders. And so really I could stop right there and you can kind of think about how the difference in limit orders and stop orders would behave differently. A limit order is guaranteed to be at that price where a stop order is really just a market, a market order that takes it no matter what. Now I know, just go with me. I know they use fancier things. You can do stop limits and they have all the, the ones where they do tranches of orders. Um, iceberg orders they have all these mechanisms but for now just go with stops a market order you know limit is is a limit order so the main thing they want you to know here is that when you sell an option here over on the left that you are adding liquidity and so by the opposite on the the right when you go long an option you are removing liquidity and so here's why they think this is all worth understanding one the spx options are the largest most transparent part of the broad markets order book two we can measure by analyzing the transaction data, the SPX dealer's actual option positions. And three, we can use the Black-Scholes model to calculate in dollar terms where those delta hedges must occur. And so the big idea is that liquidity is what determines how much the S&P 500 index can move. And so if we can measure liquidity, then we can forecast market volatility and therefore crash risk. Now, I want to put a quick slide in here for just how just how I think about liquidity, the best visualization I know of is Bookmap, and uh, I use it every day trading. And so what we have here, if, you, if you're not familiar with Bookmap, we have price on the y-axis, time on the x-axis. And these lines here are actually people's limit orders. And so as price comes down, this here at this arrow would be a limit buy. And as price goes back up, this line above price is going to be a limit sell. So in the example before, when you add liquidity, that's like one of these lines showing up on the chart. That means liquidity is added. And then to eat that liquidity up and move price, you use market orders. And so that would be removing liquidity. So that's kind of the, the main general point here with all this is that you're either adding or subtracting liquidity from the market. And we're going to work on trying to quantify that. And by, on the right here, we have the, this would be basically be your order book that time. So this was from yesterday and you can see that these are the, the numbers of limit orders that show up here in this order book. The first one is 69 and 108. So if you put a market order down for 500 at this price, it's going to eat up these first few lines and move price up there till it stops at the next limit order. So that was just a quick little off topic about how I think of liquidity. And, and I think it's easy to visualize using, using book map. And so, yeah, the main thing on this screen that I want you to see, this is for the limit buy, this is liquidity. And same thing up here for the uh, limit sell. So we go back to that slide one more time. The left side, these are the sell limits when you go short on an option and the buy limits up and below. And then the opposite over there removes liquidity. And so knowing that where they're going to add and remove liquidity is, is how we're going to build this, this implied order book. But first we need to understand deltas just a little bit better. So they put this figure in there and just a reminder, delta is how much the option price will change with per unit change in the underlying or the another definition that's common you always see is that it's the probability of that option expiring in the money so like a 30 delta put has a 30 percent chance of expiring in the money that comes from the second bullet point here that it's assumed to be a normally distributed so from which this from which we can derive a proxy for the probability that the option ends up in the money at expiration so Nice little figures here. K is strike, S is spot or the underlying price. And so we have a 50, 50 delta collar put here. Here's your distribution. The spot, it's right on the strike. The strike is right on the spot price. So the, the spot's gonna stay the same in these distributions and the strike is gonna move down. Here when strike moves under the price, that put would be a 20 delta put out of the money or if it was a call, it would be an 80 delta call, which is in the money. And then the opposite here, an in the money put over to uh, the right side of the strike or a 20 delta call, so out of the money. So the strike is above 
the price at that moment. So to track liquidity, we care about the change in Delta. So this is where you get v Gana, <laughs> Gamma, Vanna, and Charm. So what causes option deltas to change? Three things. You got change in underlying price, changes in implied volatility, and changes in time. And to options practitioners, these three delta sensitivities are known as gamma, vena, and charm. So here on the first one here, gamma, when the underlying moves down, the 50 delta call becomes a 20 delta call. So this is where it was first in the gray back there where it was a 50 right in the middle as price moves down underlying the 50 delta call becomes a 20 delta call so middle figure here vanna when implied volatility moves down the 20 delta call back here in the gray becomes a 5 delta call and then over here on the right when time elapses that 5 delta call becomes a 0 delta call that's charm and here on the on the vanna one in the middle it's important to note here that a lower IV implies a narrow distribution. So that's going to come in later. And then for charm here, they basically, they say that the, the effects are negligible. They say, even if you just did a quick analysis, you can see that it really has too small of effect to, to have practical utility. And then they throw in a back to the future quote, which I appreciated. They say, where we're going, we don't need charm. So then there's this little, little sticky note. Technically, if you want to interject and say that dealers don't hedge to Black Shoals Deltas, sure, everyone has proprietary adjustments, but that's irrelevant. So Gamma isn't a convention. Even a model-free approach to Delta hedging will have Deltas that change with the underlying IV end time. So boom, you were thinking, what if they don't even use the Black Shoals? They got you right here on the sticky note and gave you some little glasses like, technically, that's how I read it. Moving on. So they're going to define it. This you got gamma exposure or GEX, which is the option dealer's delta sensitivity to changes in the price of the underlying. And you have VEN exposure, VEX, an option dealer's delta sensitivity to changes in the option's implied volatility. So now we have it all defined, laid out. We're going to move on, but they, they put in this interim step that's very important. This is a new addition to this paper. This wasn't in the last paper at all. And they call it dealer directional open interest. And so they're going to use transaction level data or the time and sales to assess the buy and sell of every SPX option trade. And then they're going to bend it accordingly. And then the next day, they're going to verify the trade direction by tracking the subsequent OI changes. Now that, that's huge, that, that third bullet point, because that, that's the good stuff right there. This is the figure they gave. I you know didn't get a whole lot out of this figure. I don't know. Uh, what it, it doesn't really explain what it is in this figure. It's just a column. And so that's kind of an odd column, but you can get a better definition on their site and I'll link that paper as well. This, uh, this slide I put in here, I was going to talk about basically how hard it is to do that second step to do uh, buy and sell transactions. Cause I do that and it's tough. And I was going to talk about that just because it's on the ask doesn't mean you know, it was a buyer, it, you know, it can be a buyer or a sell on the ask. Nah, I'm going to leave that alone. I'm going to skip that. So moving on, they're going to put the Black Shoals formula in Python. They're going to use this function and you can plug in new values and see how much Delta changes. So they have their formula. This is going to return Delta. And so you can change the Greeks around here. And if you know how much Delta changes, you can convert that to shares or dollars. So here's an example, and they put the numbers in terms of the SPX here for a trader that shorts a 30 DTE put, days till expiration. So here we have the trader is short, the dealer is long. Um, we're trading at 3,000, that's the spot S here. The strike is 2,900. There's your time, 30 days till expiration. Row, we're not going to worry about rates. Um, and then V, your implied volatility here, they're going to set it at 20. And so when you put those in, it's going to return a delta of 27. So that means the dealer must be long 27 deltas. Or if you put that in terms of the SPX, 3,000 times 27, which is $81,000 just to be flat. So they're going to have to buy 81K to be flat. Next down here in the bottom, 
we're going to the only thing we're going to do is change the spot down to 2950 and we're going to take off a day of the time and then return delta and it gives 37 so we, our delta's changed from 27 to 37 during that drop from 3000 to 2950 and that's going to be they're going to have to now go along 109k and so in other words 28k was bid somewhere down there between 3000 and 2950 all right so so that would be for a 50 point drop how about if it were a one point drop you plug in 2999 for S and then it's going to give you $393. So the GEX is 393 bucks per point. Next thing they're going to do is add up all the GEX and present it in one figure here for at the time of this paper. And they're going to say a thorough analysis of SBX GEX back to 04 yields a surprising revelation that it's very rarely negative. And so I put up in the title here that this is again 2004 to 2020 because as I'm going to show you on the next slide um, this was I'm making this in January of 2023 and ironically uh, almost the entire year of 2022 there was more negative gex than positive so not that rare after all but at the time of this writing you can see um, it was and, and by the way just to I forgot to go through this on the y-axis here you have SPX price that follows along with the gray line that's SPX and then the blue colored is your GEX and the right y-axis here is GEX in dollars and then your x-axis is time these are years and they've they've color labeled it so that when GEX is negative it turns red and that's the point of this figure as you can see very little red but then yeah like I said this year has been a lot more negative also shout out to uh, tier 1 alpha they have my favorite emails in the morning. You guys are awesome. I'm dreading when they finally start charging for that thing. Don't. Leave it free. Moving on. Um, and the next figure, so GEX versus SPX returns. And this is one one day percent change of, of SPX. So now that we've defined it and we know what GEX is, they make this figure and put it all into one chart. So on the y-axis here, we have GEX. No, sorry. This is percent change of the SPX. And then on the X axis here, we have GEX in dollars. And so again, here's our zero to the right of it. You know, just like the first figure from the first paper. To the right, it's much tighter. To the left, it's much more sporadic. And so higher GEX, higher GEX means tighter returns because there is more liquidity. That's kind of the emphasis of this paper. It's liquidity, liquidity, liquidity. And then... How about this little observation? Look right here at the zero. I put a box around it. Why is volatility so high as zero GEX? So could be that the dealers are kind of balanced in their inventory. Recall that, that positive GEX stifles volatility. Negative GEX magnifies volatility. Well, right at zero, you're not positive or negative, so it's kind of just balanced. So it could go either way. So maybe, maybe that's it. Maybe that's why they, these are huge, huge variances right here but more likely is that it's due to implied volatilities being high and higher IVs make GEX less significant so when implied volatilities go up gammas and thus GEX move towards zero and then I just had to quote them sorry for the words I just I just wanted to put their quote right here because it says remember we're here to track the liquidity of the SPX vis-a-vis -vis its options not to find some spurious correlation between VIX and realized volatility. So buckle up, because this is where the going gets weird. <laughs> I like that. These guys got a sense of humor. I like that. Not to find some spurious correlation between VIX and realized volatility sort of reminds me of this paper I just read where they actually did put the correlation between VIX and realized vo volatility. But that's not why we're here for this. So buckle up. Because this is where the going gets weird. Whew. Buckle your seatbelt, folks. This is when it gets tough. So if you're like me, really strap in there. Five-point safety harness. Safety. So, question one. How does high IV cause liquidity to be taken from the market? Enter Vanna. So, in the same way that dealers must provide or take liquidity based on changes in the underlying price with GEX, they must also provide or take liquidity based on changes in implied volatility with VEX. 
they put this little sticky note in there. I like it that when IVs go up, GEX goes down. So when IVs go up, that means that the option implied distribution widens. A wider implied distribution means that changes in the underlying aren't as meaningful to delta. Less sensitivity of delta to the underlying moves equals less gamma. Here's a nice figure with the wide, um, wide distribution versus the narrow. And so low IV is the narrow one. And you kind of look at the slope here. So more meaningful changes to delta if that slope is steep. As implied volatility goes up and this widens, then it's not as steep. So there's less sensitivity of delta. So VEX is more dynamic than GEX. GEX is simple in that you sell an option, you cause the dealer to supply liquidity. You buy an option, you cause the dealer to take liquidity. And so, by the way, pause here. That, that's not what they said. That's kind of different from the first paper, right? Now they speak in terms of buying versus selling rather than just calls or puts. So, I mean, I guess technically not that different because of the assumptions. They said the most common options were us buying puts and selling calls. And so they just rolled with that. But now we're, we're getting into like basically all four scenarios of buying and selling calls or puts. And so uh, back to VEX, um, with VEX, the moneyness matters. It's not just who is short or long. So with that, we take it back to the calculator. So what we're going to do here, we're going to change IV for two different underlying prices, one out of the money, one in the money, and then we're going to observe the delta change. So here on the left side, we have an out of the money put, right? Strike price 2,900, spot price 3,000. So the put is below the price. On the right here, we have an in the money put. We have a same strike of 2,900, but we're gonna move price below it at 2,800. So I just wanna highlight first the V, the implied volatility. Um, it, on both of these, it goes from 20 up to 25. Next thing, we'll go through the delta. So on the out of the money put, when you put in for the calculator, here's our delta for the first one with 20, returns 27. And we change that volatility to 25, and now delta goes up. So same thing over here on the right. With the in the, mon in the money put, we have a 72 delta, and as implied volatility goes from 20 to 25, implied volatility goes up. In this example, in the money put, delta goes down, returns 67. And that the first time I read this, I was like, man, you, you're kind of losing me a little bit. I mean, I guess I follow. I guess I follow. I see it on the calculator. All right. That's hard. You know, it's like, that's kind of hard for me to wrap my head around. And so they, I think they detect that they're like, maybe it doesn't make perfect sense. But if you spend enough time looking at this cheat sheet, you'll see exactly how IV direction and moneyness cause option dealers to buy or sell the underlying. So this page right here. This is the page that's been sitting on my desk for like two years after I read this paper because I couldn't memorize it. I just would refer to it all the time. And so what this is, is these are the option implied distributions as IV changes. Okay. And so they're going to split it into calls and puts and they're going to split those into long or short. So up to four scenarios, then we're going to split those into in the money or out of the money. So up times two is eight more. And then we're going to split those into IV rising or IV declining. So that gives us 16 different scenarios here. And so the type, whether it's long or short, the moneyness and the state of the IV changes. So on the top half here, I put a line. These are all IV rising. And just a reminder that the distributions wider is higher. And you can just stare at that and go through it. But those are all the scenarios for how the delta changes just when only IV changes that's to wrap your mind around the vex part of it and so then they also throw in that about right here this is when it's a good time to get into your head that iv is a measurement of market liquidity so ivs rise when liquidity is inadequate and ivs fall when liquidity is abundant so when an option is sold it increases gex and lowers iv ivs by the way go down when people sell options when ivs go down gex goes up even more so selling an option has a two pronged effect to increase GEX add, li add liquidity. And so buying an option, however, decreases GEX, but raises IV. So 
that's a lot of words bear with me but taken together the this means that the liquidity making impact of gamma is always multiplied and the liquidity taking impact is always tempered and this by the way is why gex is rarely below zero or was at the time of this writing right um in, in the in the cheat sheet figure there are two asterisks and they're the two most common options that are in the IV up section, which are customer short out of the money calls and customer long out of the money puts. So these are two, the two biggest SPX flows. And it's basically two of the four assumptions from the original GEX paper. So it didn't technically specify moneyness, but you can imagine if you're selling a call, you're probably selling it above current price, which would be out of the money. And then if you're buying a protective put, you, you'd want it to be below the price you'd want the cheaper option and so that comes with out of the money so both of these result in dealer selling when iv rises so this right here is inherently unstable next thing they're going to plot they're going to make a similar plot over time with vex and so here they want to point out that unlike gex vex knows how to be negative so going we'll just go through this figure again left side spx price that follows the gray line right side right y-axis here we have vex in dollars and then on the x-axis here we have time and these are the years so and again they color code it whenever it's red it's negative and the, the main point here is that there's a lot more red in this vex chart than there was the gex chart next figure they're going to take that and plot it the same way they did vex with a scatter plot so the same thing y-axis spx one day percent change and then on the x-axis, we have our Vanna exposure, of X in billions. And same thing you can see again. It gets much tighter on the positive side and much more sporadic here on the left side when it turns negative. So they say that Vex is Gex's evil twin because Gex can provide so much liquidity that the range is tightened to an average of 0.2%. But VEX can take so much liquidity from the index that the average daily ranges can rise to 6%. So by quantifying both of these dealer delta hedges, we can get a whole picture, the whole implied order book that derives SPX liquidity. And what's beautiful is that these two are additive, so we can literally add the two together to get the full picture of option originated top of book index liquidity. So same style uh, chart again. Now we have GEX plus VEX, and we're going to call this GEX plus. Creative. So, so let's do this. Let's add GEX and VEX together and call it GEX plus. Same thing, SPX in gray and GEX plus now on our right Y axis. So this is the real deal. This is our, the true picture of how that implied order book affects the SPX or, or what was going on at that time. Pretty cool. Got some negative parts, kind of a little bit before the big drops, and this is a cool figure. So next thing, kind of the final step to tie it all together is plot those those GEX plus values by the SPX one day percent change. And same thing again, right side positive, tight returns, left side negative, all over the place. And so since this is the third scatter plot that we've seen of this type, and they kind of all look the same, I just tossed them all on one slide. So that you can see it here we got gex vex in the middle and gex plus vex over here on the right okay so the final step is conditional liquidity so we want to know what happens when price changes will there be buyers or sellers if the s p 500 falls five percent how about up ten percent or what will happen to vex liquidity if vix goes up 20 points what if it goes down 10 so to know all this, we need to draw a map of the order book. And by extension, this will be a map of future liquidity and volatility. So now we're getting somewhere. Now we're getting into how is this useful. And so <laughs> I remember when, when I was first reading this paper and I saw this, I was like, what am I looking at? And this is like six axes. What does what all this mean? And so, so we're going to go through it. This right here. This is cool, actually. This is a map of the order book on March 5th, 2020. This is GEX Plus. And so we're going to go through it. So left y-axis is the SBX price. The right y-axis is the percent change of SBX. At the x-axis, down here, we have VIX, um, just whatever the VIX is. And then on the 
top x-axis here. The same thing, VIX, but in percent changes. And then here on this thermometer looking thing, we have GEX plus. So going through in this moment, we're, we're, like when this was made, it's referring to this kind of where they cross. SPX was 30.23, the VIX was 40. The GIV or the gamma implied volatility, we'll talk about that on the next slide, um, was right here, 19. And the GEX plus was 0.04 billion. And so, and then I tossed a couple of uh, labels up here even though it's got GEX plus, but that this, to let you know that this number is gamma implied volatility, then the color part of it, the, the red zone here is negative GEX plus. And so this is it. This is what, this is the conditional map of liquidity. And the crazy part here is that right here, the map ends. So moving on. So let's take a closer look at, at the gamma implied volatility part. So the next slide here, that's the same chart, sad face there where liquidity ends. And so this right chart, this rainbow deal here is just a more granular, closer look at the impl gamma implied volatility. You can see here on the original one, it, it was at 19. And so they've just taken this and kind of stretched it up. And that's what we got over here on the right. So the same thing, same SPX price and VIX. And they just pose the question, what if the SPX dropped down to 2,800, which would be like seven and a half percent down. And that's by the way, with no IV change. So price just drops down and now you're at this point. Well, the gamma implied volatility, the yellow zone here where it lies is it implies a 4% average daily move. So moving on, what if the SPX dropped down to 2,800 and the VIX rose to 64? So you get that GEX and the VEX part of it. Well, now the gamma implied volatility would be 120 or 6% average daily moves. I mean, whoa, that's a lot of movement. That's pretty volatile. So this is what we call the market being offsides, that, that VIX cannot possibly price the volatility slash liquidity correctly since by moving up, the VIX causes liquidity to deteriorate. And so this means that the VIX will be underpriced all the way up to 80 plus or whatever. And when customers have sold too many puts, the crashes become feedback loops. And that's where the, the latent demand for liquidity surpasses supply and crashes only end when IVs can't possibly go up anymore. But before talking about how selling puts crash the market, I want to talk about why the customer long puts don't crash the market. So customer long puts, recall, they're the most com among the most common types of options. The short puts, which cause the crashes, they are more rare. So long puts are short dealer gamma and thus pull GEX down. Lower GEX means worse liquidity and more volatility. But since the worst kind of illiquidity is always a function of VEX, look at how the VEX affects a customer long put after it becomes in the money. So back to the cheat sheet, this is the VEX effects of a long put that goes in the money. Here it is from the cheat sheet, customer long in the money put. As IVs rise, a long in the money put causes the dealer to actually buy the underlying. So this means that when the, when things get really bad, the long puts end up adding a little bit of liquidity. And this kind of means that the effect of customers buying put protection, that it ends up to be a short, sharp correction, but not like a full blown crash. So now we'll talk about the feedback loop that actually crashes the market. This is a busy slide. So bear with me. We're just going to go through it step by step. So one, Selling an out of the money put where the dealer is long pushes the GEX up and that's going to raise VEX, which improves liquidity here in the top here, short out of the money put. And so this is going to cause dips to be bought and will increase IV to cause SPX buying via VEX, AKA if the VIX or IV spikes, dealers must buy the index. But if that put goes in the money, if the price keeps going down, put goes in the money, that fickle Vanna starts demanding liquidity whenever IVs rise. Recall here, this figure two, um, here are our limits when we, when we short an option. So we have buy limits here under, they added liquidity. And then, but at a certain point, the VEX forces them to start selling when it goes down in the money. So this top portion here, I kind of think of it like this that the top distribution here is really the GEX component, but then underneath here is really when VEX uh, sort of takes over. 
So moving on. Two, if put goes in the money, Vanna starts demanding liquidity. Three, liquidity deteriorates and the IVs rise to compensate. And then four, the rise in IVs by the virtue of those newly in the money puts, negative VEX, they demand that the option dealers short more of the index. So then it becomes impossible to sate the latent demand for liquidity and the sell-off only ends when VIX is so high that it can only go lower. So yeah, when price keeps dropping, put goes in the money, and IV goes up, suddenly the dealer is now selling, shooting it, forcing it down even more. And then fun fact that when VIX, you know, and it says that it only ends when VIX is so high it can't go any, it can't, it can only go lower. And they, a little fun fact that when the VIX does go lower, the VEX will then force those option dealers to buy back just as much as they were forced to sell. And so Q bear market rallies. So that was interesting. So that's how, that's the feedback loop that crashes the market. Last slide of the paper. Um, they say when put selling becomes the norm, that's when crashes happen. So here we just have, these are bought or sold puts. This is a ratio um, daily um, from 2004, I guess, to 2020. And there's the SPX in gray again. And this time they put it on the right Y axis. And you can see these uh-oh zones. There was lots of put selling from 2006 to 2008. And then again here, kind of 2018 to 2020, which was right before the GFC and the COVID crashes respectively. So pretty cool. This is full of irony. So bought puts add some liquidity when things fall apart. The only thing that can cause 20 to 30% declines is when so many people sell puts that the mere sign of the scarce liquidity, IV going up, automatically withdraws that liquidity from the market right when it's needed most. And so then they just, I wanted to put this direct quote in. This is the last thing, y'all. So to tie it all together, that options are just a one, options are just one way to take and supply liquidity. What's dangerous is when we distinguish options and their underlying. They are not distinct. Now, more than ever, options are the order book. And that's it. Thank you for watching, guys. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Be sure to comment um, for those video requests. If you got something out of this, I hate to ask, but if you could hit that like button on your way out, I'd appreciate it. And um, if you really liked it, go ahead and subscribe, and I'll put up more content. This, this was kind of the pilot video. I think hopefully, hopefully they'll be better. All right, thanks.